Today's story is from the Ramayana and it is about the start of the war between the Vanars and Ravan's army. We'll see how Indrajit's snake weapons almost won him the war on day 1 if a giant bird man hadn't stepped in. Welcome to Stories from India. This is a podcast that will take you on a journey through the rich mythology, folklore and history of the Indian subcontinent. I am Narad Muni, the celestial storyteller and the original time lord. With my ability to travel through space and time, I can bring you fascinating stories from the past, the present and the future. from the epic tales of the mahabharat and ramayan to the folk tales of the panchatantra to stories of akbar birbal and tenali ravan i have a story for every occasion the purpose of the stories is neither to pass judgment nor to indoctrinate my goal is only to share these stories with people who may not have heard them before and to make them more entertaining for those who have In this episode we are continuing the story of the Ramayan. It is one of the two major epics in Indian mythology. The other is the Mahabharat which we have also covered on the show. The Ramayan is all about Ram, the crown prince of Ayodhya. Despite being crown prince, there was a major obstacle before he could become king. His stepmother Kaikai pressured Ram's father into ordering Ram into exile for 14 years. Ram went, but not alone. His wife Sita and his brother Lakshman went along too. Ram was an avatar of Vishnu. Vishnu, in case you don't know, is the preserver of the universe, and he creates a kind of balance between Brahma the creator and shiva the destroyer together they are the holy trinity of indian mythology quite shameless plug here but brahma is my dad and i am president for life of the vishnu fan club and i regularly meet shiva on mount kailash so you can rest assured that this show is as authentic as it gets Ram, Lakshman and Sita survived one challenge after another in the wild. There seemed to be a long queue of demons and demonesses that had lined up to either eat them or kidnap and enslave them. The trio managed to fight off all such challenges until Ravan abducted Sita. Ravan was the ruler of lanka and the mega villain in this epic if you want a modern analogy imagine lord voldemort from the harry potter universe but with 10 heads so 10 times as evil and he was blessed with all kinds of superpowers so defeating him was nearly impossible ram and lakshman searched far and wide for Sita in this they got help from the vanars a kingdom of monkeys led by their king sugriv most of the actual help came from hanuman who was sugriv's advisor and right hand vanar hanuman found sita across the ocean in ravan's kingdom of lanka sita refused to fly back on Hanuman Airlines she insisted that Ram himself should make the trip to Lanka he should defeat Ravan and take her back in full honor Hanuman took Sita's message back to Ram but first he burned most of Lanka down 
After he returned to the Warner base camp and shared the news, the Ayodhya brothers and all the Warners crossed the ocean to get to Lanka. It wasn't easy because they had to first build a bridge. They had some help in the form of intelligence. Vibhishan, one of Ravan's brothers, switched sides and came over to help Ram. He was one of the few people who felt that his brother was in the wrong. The Varners established camp on a nearby mountain. A couple of half-hearted attempts at diplomacy and negotiation failed. And now the two sides were getting ready to go into battle. That's where we'll continue the story. As I was preparing to tell this story, I figured it might be a little bit more fun to report the kickoff, not from my inexhaustible reservoir of endless facts, but straight from the commentary box. I was eager to watch the Ramayan from a new perspective. And because I can travel in time, it's easy for me to do exactly that. So there I was, in the commentary box, overlooking the esplanade where the battle was going to take place. I introduced myself to the two commentators, Harsha Shastri and Ravi Bhogle. I was allowed to stay in the box during the battle, especially because I had brought along enough bags of popcorn for all three of us. Not too far from us, many Lankan citizens had gathered to watch the battle and to hear Harsha and Ravi. Harsha addressed them. Well, folks, what a historic occasion we have here today at the Esplanade. It's a beautiful day for war and the pitch looks absolutely perfect. It's been prepared for this. It's Warners versus Usurs. The first such battle, but very likely not the last. You can bet, Ravi, this is just the start of a long rivalry. Ravi agreed. Indeed, Harsha, these armies, they have put in their 100% for this. You can bet they've been training all their lives for just such a battle. And you can just feel the energy from both sides here. The Vanners are chattering with excitement, ready to go to bat. Just look at the practice swings they are taking with their clubs and their tree trunks. And the Lankans are yelling. No doubt they are trying to figure out field placements. There's absolute commotion and excitement in both camps. Ravi was right. There was commotion, but it seemed a little bit more pronounced in the Lankan camp. Being more than a little curious, I decided to make a quick trip there to hear what was going on. And I'm glad I did. The Lankans were yelling, but not about field placements. Ravan's army was nervous. There was a lot of grumbling. The soldiers didn't want to fight. They had witnessed what Hanuman had single-handedly done to their city. They had witnessed what Angad had done when he showed up unannounced in Ravan's court. The Asur general was having a hard time managing his troops. Luckily for him, Ravan's son, Indrajit, intervened. Sons of Lanka, I am Indrajit, your commander in battle today. A naive young Lankan said, No, you're not. Indrajit is supposed to be eight feet tall. Yes, I've heard, Indrajit said calmly. Indrajit kills men by the thousands and shoots lightning bolts out of his eyes. Nervous laughter from the others. When it died, Indrajit continued, I am Indrajit. And I see before me a whole army of my countrymen 
in defiance of these monkeys. You have come to fight against these insolent monkeys and those Ayodhya brothers. Are you ready to fight? A skeptical Lankan soldier replied, Fight against those Vanars with their firepower? No, we'll run and we'll live. I nodded Indrajit. Fight and you may die. Run and you'll live. At least a short while. Until I hunt each one of you down. And then, dying by my sword, would you be willing to trade all the time from this day to that for one chance, just one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our right to abduct their wives. Well, put that way, the Lankan soldiers quickly realized the error of their ways. They would rather face the Vanar army than have Indrajit hunt them down. Being clobbered with a tree trunk was a mercy compared to the pain that Indrajit could inflict on them. That's all I needed to see. So I teleported back to the commentary box, where Harsha and Ravi were keeping it up. Harsha said, And Asur throws the first stone. Looks like it's a big boulder headed straight for Sugriv. Is the Vanar king going to be flattened? Is there anyone who could save him? And oh my goodness, what a swing from Hanuman! He just stepped right up and swung that tree trunk and knocked the rock right out of the park. What a fabulous save from Hanuman there. Incredible footwork. Have you seen such flawless execution, Ravi? That Asur is going to be scratching his head for a while over that delivery. Absolutely, Harsha. This could be the tone for the battle that is to come. I can sense a pummeling here. We'll have to see how the Lankans regroup. And regroup they did. The two sides ran towards each other. The Vanars were fighting tooth and nail. Literally, their sharp claws and teeth were just as much an asset as the rocks and tree trunks they wielded, as Sugriv had realized when he was drawing up the battle plans. Ooh, look at that! Lakshman's arrows absolutely destroyed those warriors who were trying to simultaneously attack him from three sides. He is at the top of his game here, Ravi. Quite right. And over there, Harsha, Hanuman had just crumpled a chariot with the Asur still inside it. I didn't catch the number on that Asur's jersey. And with the chariot crumpled the way it is, I'm not sure we'll ever get a positive ID. But look over here, Ravi. This is where the battle is really heating up. Angad, Sugriv's nephew, is taking on Indrajit. This is the face off that most people are here to watch. Yes, Harsha. And there's some history between the pair. Their dads were friends. Angad's father, Wali, and our emperor, Ravan. Angad switched sides over to Sugriv. Didn't he also visit Ravan's court recently, Ravi? Harsha asked. Harsha, we are not supposed to talk about it. If someone really wanted the whole story, they could listen to episode 209 of Narad Muni's Stories from India podcast. But look now. Look at the number of arrows that Indrajit is firing at Angad. Angad ducks, he dives and escapes without a scratch. But he's bouncing back, he's coming around. And ooh, what a sneaky move there. Angad has completely taken apart Indrajit's chariot. The horses are running away, scared, and the chariot is in pieces, and the charioteer's look of surprise is, well, it's priceless. But it's strange, Ravi, I don't see Indrajit anymore. He seems to have completely disappeared. Indeed, Harsha, I think he's using his magic. He's got the disappearance trick, you know. He's used it very effectively against Indra, the chief of the Devs. Fun fact, that's how he got his name. It was true. That's how Indrajit had gotten his name, by defeating Indra, the chief of the Devs. And it was also true that right now, he was nowhere to be seen. Angad 
as well as our friends in the commentary box, turned their attention towards other parts of the battlefield. Ram was seen taking out four Asurs with a single arrow. Ravi, it's starting to get dark now, and I think the home team is going to like that. There's no technical advantage that their furry opponents will have. The Lankans know this ground like the back of their hands. That is going to be helpful in such poor visibility. I agree with you, Harsha. I wish there were floodlights or something. Or at least that we had some night vision glasses. This battle is going to be incredibly hard to track and report on. But it was only a temporary problem. Because the day's actions were about to come to an abrupt end. Ram and Lakshman had unwittingly drifted closer to each other as they battled enemy soldiers. When they were close enough, Indrajit suddenly appeared again. Over there, Ravi! Indrajit has suddenly appeared out of thin air. That's incredible! How did he do that? He has an arrow ready in his bow. He pulls the string and he's fired it. It's in the air. But was he aiming for Ram or Lakshman? Oh my goodness, it's both! Indrajit has got them both! It's his famous Nagpash and he's done it! That arrow has transformed into a net of snakes and it has entangled Ram and Lakshman both. The two of them are struggling but they can't escape this powerful weapon and now Indrajit is capitalizing on the moment. This is it folks, this is the turning point in the game. Ram and Lakshman appear to be trapped and Indrajit is raining down on them with arrows after arrows. And this is it, the Ayodhya brothers have collapsed, they are on the ground and they are not moving. This is surely victory for Lanka. And Indrajit managed to snatch it from the jaws of defeat. What a terrible day it was for the Lankan army all day. And now suddenly, the tables have completely turned. Of course, Harsha, we'll have to wait for daylight in all probability before a formal decision is made. But it does look pretty bad for the Vanar army. The Vanars are howling, they are in disarray. Even the traitor Vibhishan seems to be overcome with emotion. I don't know what he's more upset about. Losing the new friends he made two days ago? Or the realization that he can no longer become the emperor of Lanka? That's a puzzle there, Ravi. Alright folks, I think we are going to call it a day here. What a day of action it was. We'll be here tomorrow morning, no wonder, to witness the Vanars admitting defeat, packing their bags and crossing the ocean back to their land. That's it, we are signing off. Thank you all. The Lankans seemed confident that they had won. There were victorious cheers and there was a party back in Ravan's palace. Ravan hugged Indrajit and ruffled his hair and said how proud he was that his son had won the war. All without Ravan even having to step out on the battlefield. Ravan was also ecstatic for another reason. Because now it meant that Sita would have no choice but to accept him as her husband. He summoned Trijita, a demoness, who was on his staff. Go take Sita out in my flying chariot, the Pushpak Viman, he told her. Show her Ram and Lakshman from the air. He also handed her a wad of cash, along with the keys to the Pushpak Viman. The king of Lanka explained that that was money to refuel the birds. They were probably hungry. Trijata could keep the plenty of change that would be left over. Get yourself something nice, he added, quite uncharacteristically. Trijata was a little bit conflicted. Her duties were to her employer. But this was a cruel mission. Sita was weeping as she saw Ram and Lakshman motionless on the battlefield. But something was off, and Trijata said so. Don't lose heart, Sita. I don't think all is lost yet. Look at the scene carefully. Sita asked with a glimmer of hope. You're saying... Maybe Ravan stays the scene? 
I wouldn't put it past him. He did show me a fake version of Ram's head just a few weeks ago. But Trijata shook her head. I wouldn't go so far as to call it staged. There are just too many vanners on the scene. Hard to get so many actors and costumes. No, I think those are the real Ram and Lakshman. But look, none of the vanners are visibly grieving. They are silent, as if they are waiting for something. And that bear, Jambavan, I think he's called, was using a stethoscope and he did not look worried. Sita wasn't sure. I don't know if I have a baseline here. I'm not sure what a worried bear is supposed to look like. Trijata continued. And more importantly, no one is leaving. It's almost like they are waiting for something. If I were Sugriv and Ram and Lakshman had really passed away, I'd start sending at least some sections of my army home or at least out to the bridge, to guard an exit route. Instead, I see Warner's cooking dinner. That was a valid point, even if it relied on an assumption about how quickly the Warner administration might react. When they got back, all ten of Ravan's heads were puzzled about why Sita continued to remain defiant. Obviously, Neither woman mentioned Trijata's arguments that had given Sita considerable hope and comfort. Ravan figured he'd give Sita another day or two before forcing her into marriage with him. Tonight, he was going to celebrate. The mood in the Vanar camp was the opposite, of course, as I discovered when I teleported there. However, it wasn't complete dejection. Ram's and Lakshman's pulses were checked. They were found to be still alive, but barely. Sugriv and Hanuman were in a hurried conference with the doctors on his crew. Apparently, there were some herbs that might cure the Ayodhya brothers. And the doctors were supplying descriptions so Hanuman could speedily fetch them. But they were interrupted by a noise and a cheer. Ram was waking up. He had somehow managed to overcome the powerful influence of the snakes in Indrajit's weapon. He was still wounded and he felt a pang of despair looking at his brother's inert body. This was a disaster. He was considering his options when the dark sky got a whole lot darker, suddenly. There was the sound of the beating of massive wings. A huge shape descended from the sky. It was Garud. He is a half-man, half-bird, and he is also Vishnu's mode of transport. Given that Ram was an avatar of Vishnu, an introduction wasn't really necessary there. But the Vanars were clueless, so Garud introduced himself. Garud swiftly ran his hands all over Lakshman's wounds. And just like that, they all healed and Lakshman woke up. Garud did the same for Ram's injuries as well. The brothers were refreshed and felt stronger than ever. Tears of joy were shed all around, and all main parties embraced each other and thanked Garud over and over. Garud then explained that the Nagapash weapon that Indrajit had used was filled with the venom from the Nags. The Nags were Garud's cousins and also his sworn rivals, because they had enslaved Garud and his mother for years. Garud had powers in his hands and feathers to undo any damage 
those slithering snakes might inflict. A small side effect of the contact with Garud was that Ram and Lakshman were now also a lot stronger and quicker and more dexterous. Garud said goodbye and flew off. And the Vanar army cheered for Ram and Lakshman and began preparations for battle the next day. This time, Ram and Lakshman resolved that they would be prepared for Indrajit's tricks. We'll end it here this time. A few notes. We have seen Garud's story before in episode 177 and 178, including the story about how Garud came to be enslaved by the Nags and how he managed to free himself. These episodes, as well as previous Ramayana episodes, are linked in the show notes on the site sfipodcast.com. Check them out. Those who have already heard the Ramayana story before might be aware of the herbs that were supposed to heal and restore someone back from the dead. That story comes a little bit later though. In the next episode, we'll cover a Singhasan Bhatti sea story. It's been several months since we did one, and many of you listeners have been asking for one of these. So we'll go back into Raja Bhoja's world, and we'll hear another story from one of the talking idols on King Vikramaditya's throne. Thank you all for the comments on social media and on Spotify's Q&A. I can't directly reply to the questions there, but I'll address them here on this show. Nikki, Shiv, Vishrut, Arvind, Bala, thank you for the support and the feedback and the kind words. Vishrut, your sister might indeed be my youngest listener. It's lovely that you're starting her early on Stories from India. Hiranmai, loved your puns in the comments. Thank you very much. Prithvi, there is a story explaining why we don't pray to Brahma. I recommend hearing episode 46 of this show, where I've covered it. Samay, it's an interesting thought, doing a story from the future. I'm always worried about revealing too much. Because there's the classic time traveler's paradox. If you know what is going to happen, what if you do things differently and things don't happen that way after all? But I do think I can cook up a story with limited detail so I don't completely throw off the time vortex. I managed to do that with the Kalki avatar so I can probably whip up another story. And Ankur, I will get to the story of the Maharana of Kumbh soon. Arvind, you and a few others asked for the Singhasan Bhattisi, so it's coming right up next week. If you have any other comments or suggestions, or if there are particular stories you would like to hear, please do let me know by leaving a comment or a review on the site sfipodcast.com, or tweet at sfipodcast, or reply to the questions on Spotify's Q&A. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. Be sure to subscribe to the show to get notified automatically of new episodes. A big thank you to each and every one of you for your continued support and your feedback. The music is from purpleplanet.com. That's purple-planet.com. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.